coming up, he was a singer that became one of the wealthiest artists of the rock era because of his clever songs that he turned into crafty entrepreneurial maneuvers. But there was a time when he was given free drinks as compensation for entertaining bar flies. And he didn't own a collared shirt or a pair of jeans with no holes. His career was in such bad shape that he contemplated taking his own life in a hotel room. Now, the game changer was when he came to his producer with an idea for a song that described a typical day, entwining the mundane, the frustrating, and the comical. Now, the producer told him it was a terrible idea for a song, but he went ahead and he recorded it anyway. It became an iconic sing-along classic, but even more than that, it became a state of mind and the foundation of a multi-million dollar enterprise. So let's put our fins up, get on board. A good time will be had by all. It's coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Make sure to subscribe below right now to get to know the real stories behind your favorite songs, most of the time uh, from the artists themselves. So what do you do after you've had one of those crap days where every little thing seems to go wrong? I'll tell you what you do. You turn to an old friend to commiserate with and to help you hang on. You put on the music of Jimmy Buffett, a friend who understands exactly how you feel and relates to what you're going through. Been there, done that. Jimmy Buffett, he's for everybody, salted or unsalted, blended around the rocks, through good times and bad, the party, the tedious, and the melancholy. You'll feel a whole lot better when you take in some Jimmy Buffett and let him whisk you away to Margaritaville. Wasting away again in Margaritaville. Gosh, we lost a great one. When one thinks about Jimmy Buffett, images of sailing in the Florida Keys, sipping on that frozen concoction, those things come to mind. Now, it's true that Jimmy loved to party and get away from life's petty problems, but he also knew what it was like to live in a world of hurt. In the late 60s, the singer from Pascagoula, Mississippi, earned a bachelor's degree in history, and he moved to New Orleans. Jimmy was you know, searching for a way into the music business. And he performed for tourists on Decatur Street, and he played for barflies in the Bayou Room and Bourbon Street. The manager wouldn't pay him, so he played for free. Free drinks, that is. Hello, shrimp, After a year of busking and bar bouncing in the Big Easy, Jimmy moved to Nashville to immerse himself in the culture of Music City. He took a job as a journalist with Billboard magazine. Jimmy is actually the first reporter to leak the news that the legendary bluegrass tandem of Lester Flats and Earl Scruggs had separated. In 1970, Jimmy was signed by Barnaby, a record label owned by crooner Andy Williams. Uh, his debut LP, Down to Earth, at bombed, and then Jimmy went back on the road still on that elusive search to find his place in music. Uh, Jimmy traveled to Florida for a change of scenery. He actually lodged in a spare bedroom at his friend Jerry Jeff Walker's place in Coconut Grove, Florida. Uh, he and Jerry, they'd go on busking trips you know, down the Florida coast. That's actually when he discovered Key West. He loved the area so much, he moved down there. Although he loved the vertical move to the Keys, Jimmy's career, it was in reverse. He had a hard time getting gigs, and he went back to playing at bars just for free drinks. Now, at that time, music it wasn't paying any bills, so he took a job, a day job, as the first mate on the yacht of industrialist uh, Foster Talley. Jimmy learned a lot about the island culture of the Florida Straits back then, the pure and the nefarious. <laughs> Key West was a notorious port for illegal goods, and actually Jimmy spurned multiple offers to make deliveries for drug runners. But after the tragic death of Jim Croce in 1973, there was a void on the roster of ABC Dunhill. To replace Croce, the label offered a contract to Jimmy, and he recorded his second album, A White Sport Coat and a Pink Crustacean, <laughs> which was an ode to country singer Marty Robbins' hit, uh, A White Coat and a Pink Carnation. And a pink. Now, many of the cuts on Jimmy's second album would later become some of his most popular. But initially, nothing off the album really clicked, and Jimmy's career continued to flounder. 
He accepted one of the few tour offers he was given, which was to open for 60s protest singer Country Joe McDonald. And Country Joe was three years past his prime by that point, and the tour was marred with half-empty nightclubs. After four lonely days in a brown L.A. haze, Jimmy was alone in his room at the Howard Johnson Hotel in Mill Valley, California. He was despondent and paralyzed with depression. This is when Jimmy contemplated taking his own life. Now, fortunately, he dug deep and he found inspiration in his sorrow to write a song, a great one. He would later give credit to this song for saving his life. The lifeboat that kept Jimmy from drowning was his first hit single, Come Monday. That went to number 30 on the Billboard Hot 100. It went to number three on the AC chart, and it went to number 23 in Canada. Come Monday, it'll be all right. Come, Come Monday was a prime example of Jimmy Buffett's authenticity. His life wasn't all about drinking margaritas and sailing on yachts. It was a song about the hurting side of a human being, and a vivid example of how a song can quite literally save your life. That was a big part of Jimmy Buffett's ascendance. His songs, they hit home with his fans with relatable lyrics that reflected all facets of life. Jimmy Buffett sang about what was happening in his world. Now, following the breakthrough success of Come Monday, six Jimmy Buffett singles in a row were released and they all stiffed. It appeared that Jimmy would be considered a one-hit wonder at that point. However, you know what, Jimmy, he took it all in stride. He bought his first boat with the money he made off come Monday. You know, hell, if he ended up a one-hit wonder, he would have been okay with that. You know, as long as he had his boat, he would just be a happy man, just sailing around the islands. Stay here all season. In 1976, Jimmy was having a typical day. You know, he's dealing with all those little, are you kidding me, annoyances that we all experience from time to time. Uh, I guess he blew out his favorite flip-flops, and then he cut his bare heel when he stepped on a pop-top, one of those sharp aluminum pull tabs that people used to throw on the ground without a second thought. That's happened to a lot of us uh, one time or another. But then again, was it consequential enough to write a song about? Jimmy thought so. The day Jimmy reflected on, it was full of setbacks, culminated by the frustration of trying to find a shake or a salt to sprinkle on his margarita. Searching for my lost shaker salt. Like many of his songs, Jimmy started writing Margaritaville while he was on the road. He wrote some notes down in his songbook at a friend's house in Austin when he was on tour in Texas with his band, The Coral Reefers. The plan was for Jimmy to go back to Florida to work with producer Norbert Putnam, worked with Elvis and others, uh, to do his seventh studio album called Changes in Latitudes, Changes in Attitudes. When Jimmy returned to Key West, he found the inspiration to finish the song, and this happened while he was sitting at the Anchor Inn and sipping on a margarita, you know, watching the bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic creep along the thoroughfare in front of him. He just sat there dreaming of a better place than being stuck in gridlock. In that moment, he invented a place to escape from your sorrows and just enjoy the humdrum, just a wasting away in a place called Margaritaville. Wasting away again in Margaritaville. When we went down there to Miami, he didn't have that song. And uh, we we're tracking for two weeks to get 10 songs. We do one every day, sometimes two. And uh, one morning at breakfast, he said, uh, I've got another song I'm trying to finish. He said, I've had it a while. And if I could get it done, maybe we can get it on the sessions. And I said, well, what's the name of it? And he said, Margaritaville. And I didn't like the title. <laughs> I had worked with Henry Mancini. I played acoustic bass with Mancini. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, he wrote a beautiful ballad for uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's called Dreamsville. Motown studio was called Hitsville. And when Jimmy Buffett said to me, Margaritaville, I was thinking, is that the best you can do this situation? <laughs> but fortunately for me, no one else had ever thought about it that way. You know? and, and about a week later, I think we had two days to go. And he comes in at 11 o'clock. He's got his legal pad, lyrics all scratched out. He said, give me a rhythm guitar. He sat down where the rhythm guitar player would sit, put his, put his, lyrics up there and he started 
<clears throat> well, the first thing was the rhythm was a straight eight. It wasn't the finger picking he normally used, which makes it more rockable, okay, with the rock yeah. song. And then he started with a lyric. Oh, and David Briggs and I had a very successful publishing company. And we only had three writers. A couple of years, we finished in the top 10 in Nashville. These companies had 40 writers. But our three writers are great writers. But they would come and play a song. And, 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 and when it's my turn to listen to the guy's song, I'm always trying to figure, you know, a song is the world's greatest short story. The shortest short story is what it is, okay? You, got, you keep throwing stuff out. And Jimmy's doing, uh, he's doing, uh, it's, what's that first lyric in Margaritaville? Him, I flip flop, stepped on a pop top. He actually stepped on a beer can. Okay. I flip flop, stepped on a pop top. And, and, and it's going pretty good. And I think it's a pretty good story. But one of the things, do you know what the most important element of every story is? I had this in 10th grade literature class and I missed it. What's that? Conflict. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, so, and so after that, Maybe the only thing you ever learned in literature. <laughs> so I'm, I'm so it's all going so well. I thought, hmm, how's he going to get into conflict? And so he, then he starts on that course. I'm wasting away again in Margaritaville, searching for my lost shaker of salt. Searching for my lost shaker of salt. Some people claim there's a woman to blame, but I know it's my own damn fault. Humility. Then we got to hug this guy, right? Oh, he covered all the bases in two lines. I think it's one of the greatest uh, pop lyrics I've ever heard. I would, I would, I would, I would have hugged him if I could have gotten to it because the whole band was hugging him. <laughs> it's my own damn fault. That was the song of all the songs I ever produced that I would have put my own money on. Matter of fact, I said to Jimmy when we finished mixing it, I said, Jimmy, you and I are flying to California. We, it was produced for ABC. And the guy who's head of promotion, really good guy. I said, but we're going to present this in person. I'm not, not mailing this. And so we went out there and we played him that one song. His eyes lit up. And I said, so uh, can we count on you? He shook his head like this. And when the record came out two months later, from Maine, Florida, every reporting station was playing Margaritaville. Yeah. <laughs> I, took a, I took a deep breath. But that was necessary because, you know, and it was such a, such a great, it, you know, I still hear that thing and like it. And it's been, that was 1977. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like To say the least, Norbert Putnam was underwhelmed when Jimmy presented the idea for Margaritaville. Uh, Norbert told Jimmy it was a terrible idea for a song. Terrible. But you know what? Jimmy Buffett didn't listen. In his mind, a song about uh, the laid-back mindset of a small island city, a place where no one knows your name and no one cares if they do, was perfect for the ethos of his new album. Jimmy came back a few days after Norbert's harsh criticism with a completed lyric sheet highlighted with Wasting Away Again in Margaritaville. That was the chorus. Wasting away again in Margaritaville. And, you know, Norbert was officially on board from there. In that part of the 70s, Key West was a rundown Navy town with tiny hangouts and restaurants, and musicians drifting around playing for bar money, just waiting to be given an identity. But Jimmy Buffett gave an identity to Key West, and subsequently he established an irrepressible image as a music icon. In latitude, in attitude, Norbert Putnam realized how important Margaritaville would be for the success of the album, and for Jimmy's career for that matter, so his production direction on the record really was indispensable. Norbert's veteran wisdom helped give Margaritaville a, a tropical escapism that immediately resonated with its listeners. The first great decision that Norbert made was to record Margaritaville at Miami's Criteria Studios. And because Jimmy would love that it was located right by the ocean, 
And the studio had been the recording site of many pivotal career albums with the likes of the Eagles and Eric Clapton and also the Bee Gees. Norbert and Jimmy, they devised a daily work schedule, started at 11 a.m. and ended at 5 p.m. This was so that everyone could reconvene on the Jimmy's Pride and Joy, his 33-foot sailboat, so they could listen to the cassette of what they had recorded during the latest session. Uh, the routine was all according to the plan to, to capture a, a vibe, you know, to fit the rhythm of the ocean waves caressing Jimmy's boat. Watching the sun bake. Another season Norbert Putnam move was actually bringing in Kenneth Buttry to play congas and drums on Margaritaville. Now, Jimmy Buffett, he wanted to work exclusively with his own guys, you know, with bandmate Michael Gardner playing drums. But Norbert, he wasn't hearing the sound that they were looking for, listening for. In Norbert's experience, road drummers rarely work as well with headphones as a seasoned musician. So he brought in Buttry and uh, you know, who was praised as one of the most influential session players in all of Nashville history. Swapping drummer and percussionist, that ensured that Margaritaville it would come off as imagined. And the track was perfectly executed in just three takes. Tattoo. Now, in addition to Buttrey's uh, contributions, Mike Utley's clavichord filigree, that set up Jimmy, uh, the vocal intro that was great. He came up with the flute and recorder arrangements as well. Uh, actually, he did it by when he was sitting at the pool drinking margaritas. <music> then there was Jimmy's disdain for headphones in the studio as well. Norbert's solution to that was to set up a pair of big red monitors with 15-inch speakers about a foot apart positioned just behind Jimmy's ears. That trick enabled Jimmy to perfectly hear what he was singing without having to wear the headphones. Norbert estimated that they were able to cut Margaritaville within 30 minutes of Jimmy playing the song for the production team. Amazing. Fact is, when Margaritaville was released as the lead single for Changes in Latitudes, Changes in Attitudes in 77, it was a surprise hit. Slowly sailing to number eight on the Billboard Hot 100 and number four in Canada, the single also traveled all the way to number one on the AC chart in America and Canada. The carefree appeal of Margaritaville, it created a pop culture sensation and a business empire that is one of the greatest success stories of the rock era, far exceeding the song's peak position on the chart clear back in 77. But it's the authenticity of the song's composer, Jimmy Buffett, uh, that's made Margaritaville such a phenomenon. He was the real McCoy. What you saw is what you got, and the fans had found their disciple a carefree release in tropical escapism. I blew out my flip -flop. Margaritaville, it also brought out the brilliant businessman in Jimmy Buffett, something akin to business tycoon Warren Buffett. Now, factoring in revenue from extensive touring, music sales, merchandising, and his national Margaritaville restaurant chain. Uh, Forbes magazine analysis estimated Jimmy's net worth at a billion dollars. Good fortune couldn't have come to a more genuine artist, a more genuine guy. There's so many stories of Jimmy having drinks with members of the audience after one of his concerts in Florida. Uh, every time that happened, he gave a fan an incredible memory to savor. He was also really good about answering fan mail. Jimmy made it a point to read and answer as many fan letters as he could every single month. I mean, he was just as fascinated with his fans as they were with him. Jimmy was that type of guy, though. No gimmicks. Completely unaffected by his fame. After Margaritaville, Jimmy gave us more good time and heartwarming classics. I mean, there was Cheeseburger in Paradise. Paradise, I'm just a cheeseburger in paradise. Fins. You got fins to the left, fins to the right, and you're the only Volcano, It's My Job. Where I'm gonna go in the volcano, bro. Well, you can sing now. It's my job, but without it, I'd be less than what I am. One Particular Harbor. Just to name a few. He also did a hell of a cover of Southern Cross, originally sung by Crosby, Stills and Nash, amongst other covers. He was so great, so much passion. It's all part of the culture that Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville created. 
a fun live and let live community where everyone is rich in friendship and sharing the songs of a genuine artist who was worshiped by his millions of faithful fans and his peers. For three decades, he was one of the highest growing tour acts in the entire world. You know, I have to share one of the most random examples of pure admiration for Jimmy Buffett as we end up here. Uh, it was an encounter with one of the most influential yet private musicians of the rock and roll era. I guess Jimmy was strolling down the Key West Harbor Walk, looking in a window of a marine supply store when he heard a voice behind him say, hey, Jimmy, that's a nice looking pair of shoes, isn't it? Can't do a very good impression of him. Huh? Jimmy turned around and he saw that voice came from the great Bob Dylan. The two of them had a couple of laughs and you know, Bob, who was on vacation, invited Jimmy out on the boat that he had rented and the two superstars, they just spent a day together. Had to cruise on back home. Jimmy Buffett adored his fans, just as much as they adored him, like I said. So much so he altered the lyrics of Margaritaville when he sang it in concert, just to pay tribute to those he called the best fans in the world. For all of you, the Paradise, the best fans in the land. Without who this would not be possible. Jimmy changed the lyrics and mentioned the parrot had several times during live renditions of Margaritaville that he performed more than a hundred times a year. In verse one, he's saying, all you parrot heads covered with oil and signs and pins. And then at the end of the song, he declared his gratitude. You know, thank you again, parrot heads, not just for tonight, but for 30 years of doing this. I just feel very lucky to be doing it. Well, there's booze in the blender. Like I said at the beginning of this, we lost a great one. So much gratitude for your music, Jimmy, for your gregarious charm, and for giving us an escape from our everyday problems. The cresting of a beautiful ocean wave. You lived your life like your songs, till your last breath on earth, actually. And that was the way your journey should have ended. I mean, wherever you are, you're probably nibbling on sponge cake, strumming your six string, and having a nice zesty margarita. Because after all, it's five o'clock somewhere. Oh, 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 oh,